Hi, and thank you for joining us today. This is Deanna James, the Director of Marketing for Castlewood Treatment Centers and All Affiliates. And today we're going to do this alumni webinar on um, feeding the spirit, integrative treatment of eating disorder with, with families, and really talking about families in recovery. And um, Christine Jackson, who is the Clinical Director at Monarch Cove, our California affiliate, is going to be lecturing today on that. And we will have time at the end for questions. So if any of you alumni have questions out there or you know, are interested in, you know, um, asking specific questions about families in recovery or the recovery process, please feel free to uh, type those questions on the uh, questions feature of your GoToWebinar screen, and we will address those. So without further ado, here is Christine. Thank you, Deanna, and uh, thank you and welcome for those that are listening. It is a great honor to be speaking, and I put on my first slide a postcard of where I am speaking from. Uh, the Monarch site is featured on our, our my first page, and it's a beautiful location out here in Pacific Grove, California. So without further ado, I would like to jump right into the content so that we can leave time for questions if there are any or comments at the end. And I very much welcome those throughout. Um, it is very nice to know who I'm talking to through a webinar, and that happens through comments or questions. So please feel free to make this as interactive as you are computer savvy and able to do so. For my presentation of eating disorders, I'm going to be talking about the three and four distinct types. And although they are distinct, I put them in the slide as overlapping because they certainly are. So we're going to be talking about eating disorders as the umbrella term for anorexia nervosa, binge eating disorder bulimia nervosa, and eating disorder NOS, or not otherwise specified. And pretty much for those that are probably on the website, this may be a review, but anorexia or anorexia nervosa is an eating disorder characterized by self-starvation, restriction of food intake or calories, and sometimes excessive weight loss. It's one of the serious eating disorders that is a psychological disorder that goes well beyond out of control dieting. And in fact, 4% of people who experiment with excessive dieting or exercise unwittingly and unwillingly turn on the clinical syndrome of an eating disorder. That being said, it's, it is a, as if someone is going for a New Year's resolution or wants to, a, to maintain a certain weight or get down to a certain dress size or pant size and then all of a sudden in the pursuit of that goal the clinical syndromes of an eating disorder and the psychological disorder that it is turn on. And so once I was going towards a certain goal it's as if the eating disorder turns around, grabs hold and doesn't let go. It comes with an intense fear of gaining weight or the word fat. It sometimes uh, involves weight loss and for some women it involves ceasing to have a menstrual cycle. So there is an extreme concern with body weight, shape or size and the person again may begin through dieting but over time the weight loss becomes an illusion of mastery and control so it becomes an obsession and is very similar to a drug addiction which I'll go into later. So perspective is lost on appearance and becomes distorted and no amounting, uh, amount of dieting or starvation or restricting can serve the ultimate goal that was started with. Um, it can come with again compulsive exercise, fear of social places, isolation, relentless pursuit of thinness, etc. And that's the one that our media has spent most time on and maybe most noticeable. And Binge eating and bulimia nervosa are related illnesses, and by that I mean that bulimia nervosa is the eating disorder characterized by compulsive, secretive overeating or binging, followed by purging, which can happen through vomiting or other compensatory behaviors. For instance, sitting on a Stairmaster and counting the calories and making sure that the calories outputted on that Stairmaster are more than whatever I've inputted for the day. So a person who suffers from bulimia can purge normal amounts of food with no binging behaviors prior to the purging. And the purging can also include laxative abuse, diet pills, diuretics, or uh, excessive exercise, as I've said, 
to neutralize the food intake. And many of the people with bulimia nervosa or even the next uh, eating disorder I'm going to refer to, binge eating disorder, are at an average weight. So the size of the person, the look of the person does not always look like an eating disorder because most people who use that phrase are speaking mostly of anorexia. So similar to anorexia nervosa, it is a psychological illness and it can extend way beyond out of control dieting and quickly become an obsession that someone loses control over the behaviors and is unable to stop a cycle that is completely self-sabotaging. And again, there's binge eating, which is a pattern of disordered eating, which consists of episodic, uncontrollable eating. Binging on food is a symptom of binge eating disorder and also often of bulimia nervosa. And when the binging is followed by the compensatory behaviors, such as purging through vomiting, laxative abuse, etc., then we call it bulimia. When it's without those compensations, we call it binge eating. And during an episode, a person might rapidly consume large quantities of food. And it's not unusual. I had a client yesterday saying, I went on a binge. I went through the grocery store, bought food, binged on it, went to another grocery store, then went through the fast food. So there's huge quantities sometimes of food. And then without any purging, it's just called the binge eating disorder. And often the binge eating functions to help the sufferer manage overwhelming emotions or stressful, stressful events. It's as if it's a huge quantity of food that is used as a numbing agent while the binge eaters often feel powerless and are unable to control consumption. And they might engage in single episodes of binge eating and other people binge throughout the day. And some people do all three. Most people with eating disorders have gone through different symptomatology or patterns of behavior. So even to have a slide where it shows three of them distinct but overlapping is probably not speaking to the overlapping part of the commonality of the psychological disorder that is called eating disorder. So for the rest of the talk, I will normally describe it as eating disorders. And one of the common threads throughout is that it is typically fueled by a body dissatisfaction within a larger societal hostile context. So I have this slide just as a reminder that reflections in this mirror, whatever that our mirror may be, is often distorted and even imbued by an inherent uh, mis-message of a socially constructed ideal of beauty. And most people have at some point in their life taken beauty as not an adjective but as an ideal and then gone in the pursuit of that perfection to the point where it may well turn on the clinical syndromes of an eating disorder. There is actually a, she's holding a Barbie doll and it's actually a whole society of Barbieisms and they come in all shapes, ages and sizes but whereas the Barbie doll has maybe been a plaything and was originally reflected uh, in a standard of beauty, it has now become a entire mass uh, collection of people who have followed that ideal and have gone towards the desire to be uh, that proportion size with a vacant look. It's really shocking that Huffington Post had 10 days ago one of a Ukrainian model named Valerie and she is a the quote unquote real life Barbie doll and I didn't want to give her more airtime in this talk but it is to say that she got more press 10 days ago because she has her followers believing in breatharianism which means that you can subsist on love and light and air alone which sounds a lot like some of the anorexics that we treat here at Monarch Cove and to say that there is this ideal is not to escape that there is this ideal that's been presented and sometimes subscribed to by men. In fact, um, we now know that there is men are the fastest growing size of population of people with an eating disorder. In 2003, there was a study by Harvey and Robertson that looked at different action figures, such as the ones that I presented. They looked at G.I. Joe, Luke Skywalker, Batman, and Wolverine. And in the period from 1973 to 1988, they noted that the chest size of the action figure expanded 
from 44.4 centimeters to 54.8. And at the same time, the biceps went from 12 to 26 centimeters, while the waist size reduced from 35.5 to 31.7 centimeters. And the abs got terrifically defined. So the imbued nature of an ideal has become sharply contrasted with what is real in also the male population. And there's a huge discrepancy. These two action figures show a period of time, but they also show that there's a huge disparity in the middle, meaning there are some, uh, particularly in the LGBTQ po population, that go towards a thinner and thinner ideal, while there are some people that go towards a larger, more muscular defined role. Um, and in the decade after the study, one in 10 individuals with an eating disorder were male with a rise of 250 percent. And now, currently, we know that 10 million of the 30 million people suffering from an eating disorder are men. We know that 15 percent by studies of anorexics or bulimics are male, while 35 percent of people with a binge eating disorder are male. And there's one more population rise that we are currently seeing and addressing at Monarch Cove, which is the rise of the women in transitions. And what I mean by that is the ages of 40 to 60 who have had some sort of adjustment to their life or lifestyle. So I pulled up a quote by the Velveteen Rabbit that says, you become, and it takes a long time. And that's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or have to be carefully kept. And generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been left off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. And it's a lovely sentiment. And unfortunately, the reality for some of this age population of women is that they're the people who don't understand and deem ugly. And we have a whole population of people who break easily, have sharp edges, and have to be carefully kept here. And there's a misunderstanding if it's a transitional age where they've been a caretaker or have worked really hard at a career that has become their purpose. And those things are transitioning with the aging process, then sometimes that's a very unkind and overwhelming process that gets into a point of confusion over identity, not just role. So those are the three larger and growing populations. And regardless, as a family member, it's really tough to understand why are the numbers growing? Why does my loved person have this disorder? And it's very difficult to understand, partially because the complexity of the disorder itself. And we want to see this as a disorder of choice and or self-will and discipline, self-discipline, because if it were that, then we're but the solution to be that easy, because it would be as easy as eat more, eat less, exercise more, exercise less. But it no longer, once it's a psychological disorder, goes into an easy formula of being able to have a solution that is related to amount of input and output of either exercise or caloric. This picture denotes, and it's one that has been around in the field for a very long time, but the psychological of point of being seen and seeing myself as two different things. So we're going to address that and try to understand that rather than understanding it as a choice, it's helpful to understand it as a disease. And we have a phrase in the addictions field um, at large that says genetics loads the gun while environment pulls the trigger. And we know a lot about genetics, which I'm going to go to, into for a second uh, in a minute. But we also know that there's a whole bunch of things. So we know that some people are wired specifically towards addictions, including eating disorders. Then what's the rest of it? Well, we know the rest of it is an onset of comorbidities such as depression or an anxiety, and that 70% of people who have uh, anxiety predate their anxiety to the onset of their eating disorder. And then there's puberty, which uh, during puberty, on average, an adolescent can gain 40 pounds in four years. And that's not the only change. Beyond hormonal flooding, everything around me changes. My object relations to both myself, to my peers, which are at that point my developmental stage, my mirror, 
for instance, when I was a little girl, I was fast approaching those teenage years, and I still felt like a little girl, and it may have been very natural for me to pop on my father's lap once in a while, but there was something that was different, either how it was seen or there was something that felt like, oh, wow, this is no longer okay. The inside of my brain might have been much younger than my body was developing to be at that point. And not being able to understand it in context that everything was changing, it was easy to get the message that I was bad, not just the change was bad. So there's so many imbued messages at that time along with your peers um, beginning to objectify, meaning who is developing faster or slower is becomes a point of conversation sometimes in those years. That's the point where we know that most often 90% of people with the eating disorder can date their the onset of their eating disorder to somewhere around 12 or younger, and it is becoming younger. We also know the other parts that contribute the, to the environment pulling the trigger is family difficulty, divorce, conflict, secrets, and that um, part of the shame that might bite in secrets might lead to that same alluded to lack of contextual understanding and interpretation that there's something that is, I'm bad. It's not that something is happening bad, it's that I'm bad. And that's why sometimes secrets trip up the family into a cycle of secrecy and then shame. And traumatic events, abuse, rejection, injury, or failure. And very often we know by research that eating disorder clients and loved people are ones with really high IQ, we know that by research, with a social sensitivity, with a fear of failure and sometimes of success because fear of success is that if I do not think I'm deserving of the accolades, then that may further fuel my, my thoughts about I am not deserving. And then we know that it's uh, the person with a really poor self-esteem at the base of all of that, regardless of the accolades. So those can be traumatic events. And trauma is, at this point for me, at least for this presentation, defined as anything that overwhelms the person's coping mechanisms at the given time. So for instance, I may have had my tonsils out when I was three because I needed to. Um, I was getting too many colds and that turned into infections. But if that surgery was happening at a time where I could not put into context an understanding, then it might be very frightening for me that people in white masks and bright lights were seeing me put me to sleep, I woke up and mom wasn't anywhere around and I couldn't speak. So anything can be stored as trauma. And we're having a point of research that's more and more about resiliency. So the next time I speak at a webinar, it may be about that, about how some people are more resilient or able to contextualize um, things that happen to them as trauma versus not trauma. And finally, major transitions such as separation, individuation, and an identity crisis. And I think those really speak to the easily broken and the ones that must be carefully kept and the ones with jagged edges because we spoke about the identity crisis that might exist when you're a 40 to 60 year old woman and the reasons why you have been living your life have shifted for you and role becomes identity crisis or role separation becomes identity crisis. And we spoke about the onset of puberty maybe creating an individuation or an identity crisis and not knowing why. And it's a separation at that point in that developmental stage from family to peers. So all of that is in there. And then back to the genetics. So that's all to say that whoever's listening, if you're a parent, this is not a shame or blame program, and there's a lot of factors that contribute. To go back to the genetics, because many families come with the question, what did I do, what did I not do? Well, there, we do know by research that genetics plays a piece. And there's a recent study by Professor Klump at MSU, amongst others, in 2012 that has been replicated. And plus or minus 2%, we now contribute 50% of someone's genetic susceptibility to having an eating disorder as the genes themselves. So more than, or at least, half 
of the genetic susceptibility is how someone came into the world and how they are wired. The studies and how far we're going back into the genetic predisposition towards is going further and further all the way into the womb. So the current twin study that fascinated me was that there's an argument that prenatal estrogen flooding may precipitate an eating disorder, meaning from the same uh, person clump farther back in his career, that when there was a study of twins, people with an eating disorder that had a fraternal male twin fared better than those with a fraternal female twin. And I guess all this to say part of my fascination with both twin uh, studies and being in the field is because I have been on the other end of understanding and trying to understand the complexity of this disorder as the family member of. Um, I am my own best twin study, in fact, and it was hard for me to carry the, no pun intended, weight of trying to understand the struggle of someone that I loved very much through different phases of an eating disorder. Now we know that the burden of care for families with an eating disorder individual is higher than those with other psychotic or disorders, including schizophrenia. And one of the reasons I think that is is because it's been so hard to identify. I think if I had a quarter for every family member who said, you know, I did notice this, but I thought it was just a phase, or doesn't everybody try to exercise uh, vehemently right before the prom? It's very insidious, and it's a cyclical, pervasive problem that gets worse as time goes on, so it's hard to put a finger to or put hands around even the understanding of the depth and the complexity and how far it sometimes goes back for clients. We also know a terrifying statistic is that more young women die from eating disorder and complications of an eating disorder than any other mental illness, which is frightening. And uh, know that many family members understand the severity of the problem, and with that comes sometimes the helplessness of why do they keep doing it. I put up a poem by one of my clients who allowed me to use it, and it says uh, ANA as an acronym for anorexia. And ED, or ED, is the, is the acronym, rather, for eating disorder. And it says, ED is running Anna's house, compulsive criminal, occupying the lethal neighborhood in between her ears, wanting what he wants when he wants it. ED is running Anna's house, bonding addicts together by denial, impulsive outbursts. ED wants what he wants when he wants it. And ED is running Anna's house. Death is an option. And even our clients who come to us, your loved ones that come to us, think sometimes that death is not only an option, but the only option to escape the mental war that is going on between their ears and understanding that it may be lethal and may believe that the only relief is uh, death. And it is really both inspiring and keeps me in this field to understand and see that moment where someone maybe days into it, or maybe even a couple weeks into treatment says, oh, I believe. I know that there is hope. I know I don't always have to live this way. Um, and people don't. For family members, it might be um, helpful to understand that at some point, when it becomes the psychological disorder, that, that there's a real function to the eating disorder, and people are clinging for life to something that will lead to death, and it's an oxymoronic, um, horrifying thing to watch when it's someone that you love. But for someone with an eating disorder, that eating disorder itself may, may perform a function that is far greater part of their identity than even the functionality of it. For instance, it can be a substitute relationship. Food doesn't talk back. Food never gets angry at me or a war to, pro to provide predictability. If my entire world is feeling out of control, I can at least control what goes in my mouth. Or it can be and we, a good girl rebellion. It can be a, a screaming to recorrect a course that no longer feels like it's mine. For instance, I always got good grades, I worked really hard, and then the pursuit of the grades became, became not just about the grades, but became an end 
not just a means. So now I'm caught in the cycle that I have a perfectionist feeling towards myself and judge anything that can be as less, and I've caught myself into this hamster wheel of perfectionism that's going so fast that I don't know how to get out. And this could be one way. Or it could be a communication, uh, a way to express a, a cry for help, a screaming of how chaotic it feels. It can be a way to shout out for help, have a substitute for life, or a lot of people talk about fearing becoming an adult or the adult body that comes with it. And so it's a way of keeping small, keeping small in spirit or in my life, which is a way of not taking responsibility and a fear of failure underlying or a feel of success that's not deserved. So it can be a way of staying sick enough to be connected to family or separating from them, or it can be a replacement for an identity. Now I'm that eating disorder girl. I never, or young man, I never really fed in, but now I haven't, you know, this is the way I now define myself as the sick one, not just in my family, but within my own mirror of self. It can be a manifestation that often is of an unresolved trauma or having something that is my own. Um, we talked about the perfectionism and the push-pull of I must but I can't. And so oftentimes when relating to someone that I love that is, has an eating disorder, it's really confusing because what I'm seeing or even relating to is often the eating disorder. And the most powerful person in a dysfunctional relationship often feels like the most dysfunctional, meaning that the rules of the house have often changed. We just had a family week and a family that came and other families shared about what they have done to basically accommodate to the eating disorder. If you've taken things out of your cupboard because you were afraid that someone was going to binge them or they weren't the right amount or the right kind of food, or if the eating disorder person has, from their eating disorder voice, ordered certain things to be in the house or not in the house, and it's been accommodated to. Um, there's often this phrase, and it came up again during working with families last week, that it feels sometimes like you're walking on eggshells. And then even more explosive, maybe it feels like you're walking on landmines because there's so many things that um, can come with an eating disorder the rules and the rigidity that then the person with the eating disorder tries to parlay into the rules and the rigidity of their surroundings. But in fact, it's a symptom of the problem. And it may be helpful to really note that sometimes you're dealing with the eating disorder, but that is an overlay to the person that you know and love that is still there. All the beautiful qualities that you have engendered in a beautiful relationship with your family member are still there somewhere. But if someone is in their midbrain of their addiction, then they're not having access to those beautiful qualities that are built and honed through relationship in their prefrontal cortex. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail of that later. So it may be helpful to understand that I can get really, really upset and disappointed, angered, whatever the emotion is, at the eating disorder and it can be very confusing because that eating disorder may be overlaid on the person you love, but it's not the same thing. And how do we know? Well, we know because we do a lot of treatment. And the three phases of treatment that we've really designed uh, our course of treatment at the Castlewood Centers have been based on the stabilization, processing, and integration model, which is borrowed from a trauma field and works really well because the understanding that there's a lot of trauma that is often at the base of the eating disorder. If it did not, if it was not one of the bullets that loaded the gun, then certainly in the course of an eating disorder, then there's a lot of trauma that's involved to get to the point where it is a psychological disorder um, and you're not functioning or feeling or having relationships. So, and I think many family members can actually relate to that because we know that there's some anxiety, depression, um, feeling lost, hopeless. I'm talking to a parallel between the person with the eating disorder and the family members that surround that person. So we know that that in and of itself, if I am not trying to overuse the word, but loving someone with an eating disorder can be very traumatizing. So going back to the 
Velveteen rabbit model, uh, we know that there's eating disorders and trauma and how we overlay the matrix of how we do stabilization, processing, and integration on that model is to really understand that a lot of programs do some stabilization and some even do some processing, but to truly integrate, to create a life that is worth living and having is to integrate the processing after a period of stabilization. And that looks different whether, as the Velveteen Rabbit would put it, you're one of those that gets easily broken or has been broken. If it feels like a trauma, then it's really important to get all the way to the point of integration, understanding how it has affected self-concept relationships. And I'm talking about the eating disorder. I'm also talking about the, tra the trauma that came along with it or is underlying to it. And that, that can affect everything from who am I to what are my values and beliefs. And it's really important to broaden and then build on a quality of life to even believe that I can have one would be beyond the trauma, which has to be in some ways dealt with and healed so that we're not putting something on top of an exposed wound. And at the same time, the Velveteen Rabbit talked about those that um, have jagged edges or are anxiety-filled clients. And again, a lot of eating disorder comes with anxiety, and so there is a huge process of stabilization. At Monarch Cove, we have an anxiety specialist who does different hierarchies, or in other words, in layman's terms, prioritizes what challenges to give someone with an anxiety disorder that, un that overlays, underlies the eating disorder. For instance, during a period of stabilization, there we might be treating someone with a lot of rigidity around food, and we might um, allow some of that just so that it calms down the person so that they can be in the room. For instance, okay, um, you don't eat red meat. That's okay. We'll have an option and we'll begin to work on the underlying and other things, exposures to things very slowly. So by the time that they're in the processing and exposure phase, we can challenge someone to say, you know, why don't you try to expand your palate? doesn't mean going beyond your values or beliefs, but it does mean broadening your plate and in doing that, that's a microcosm or a metaphor for broadening your experience of the world. We don't want to continue to treat and dance around the eating disorder. We want in, to invite someone into the dance of life itself. And that involves coming into challenges and understanding that I am just fine afterwards. And finally, the ones that must be carefully kept in the Velveteen Rabbit language. We, all of these are on the website. So going fast and breaking the rule of not having too much in a PowerPoint, all of these three on how we do stabilization, processing, and integration are on our Castlewood website. So with eating disorders and attachment, we know a lot more in the past decade about attachment disorder and how um, it becomes strikingly apparent pretty quickly when we're working with someone with an eating disorder because oftentimes our relationship with the eating disorder mirrors the fears that surround an attachment disorder. I can't let go of it. Um, who am I without this, etc. So again, the process of all the way through to integration is to broaden and expand the quality of life. But this time we're building a different kind of narrative around the eating disorder and we're allowing the person to practice boundaries. Ideally, a person can get to the point where there's a lot of things that have happened in relationships and they have happened and it no longer is a comment on me. So for instance, um, I, I changed my narrative around a painful breakup. It was a painful breakup. It was not the all of my experience or a predictor of how I do relationships and so therefore I will never go into one again or I'll attach quickly knowing that the other shoe is going to drop and I'm going to be left broken hearted. There's um, a mediation in all of that to be able to come to life in a way that stabilizes the concern and allows someone to live it, not from fear, but through love of life. And then just a, a note about the other, if we're truly doing integrative treatment around here, we know that there's other substances that come involved. We have some people who um, truly believe, particularly bulimics, that they use alcohol to facilitate purging 
or we have some anorexics who believe that they can drink their calories or they can replace food with alcohol because it gives them the feeling of having energy for a while. Same with cocaine. Uh, it can be used as a, a weight loss, so to speak, but it can become its own addiction, which often happens. And uh, there's a lot of diuretics that have sort of a speed up mentality to them, so that's why we try to go back to the one and only thing that we know that truly helps as a medicine. A medicine not just to cure some of the symptoms or alleviate some of the symptoms of an eating disorder, but cures the underlying psychological obsession, and that medicine is food. Um, so we do have, especially in California, some people who come with uh, or claiming the medical marijuana reasons for use, but we know that it can increase desire for food or increase appetite, or there's blends that don't. So to any substance that's being used to either enhance or deny myself my satiety or my hunger cues, part of an issue that we need to address. And it's hard to address because uh, the profile of someone with an eating disorder stereotypically has been someone who is driven towards perfection and accolades. The stereotype of an addict, however, has been, you know, with ch cheating, lying, stealing, manipulation, and we know by research that they are coming more closely aligned in what we understand the addictive process to be. But no one really wants to note that my loved person who she or he looks so great on the outside in terms of the accomplishments and may be very much suffering from the inside is closely aligned in the process or the pathogenesis to the addiction world that we know um, has been growing but has grown from the point of understanding it from 1945 and even before that in the 1800s we studied addiction process through a male criminal population because they were a set people that we could study. So understanding that I do want some time for questions, I'll kind of go through the rest uh, quickly, but I'm open to questions or comments. And we are, I guess, with the addictions field and understanding the biochemical chemistry of the brain, we know the significant neurotransmitters that are determinants in eating disorder and substance use disorders. And we know that opiates, for instance, increase feeding and eating disorder and also increase alcohol intake. And so we can go down and we know that we've studied links between um, different substances that I can ingest and different substances that are already in the brain and what's happening with the neurotransmitter process. And it's an area that fascinates me, but there's a whole field of research to that that I will allude to and go on. Um, oftentimes we understand that eating disorders come with different other access to disorders or even access one, and some of those are impulse control disorders. We know that individuals with bulimia and a lifetime of impulse control disorder have more extreme personality profiles, especially on novelty seeking or impulsivity than, we, than other people that have um, bulimia without the impulse control disorder. So the genetics pulls the gun, environment pulls the trigger, we're more often to see the trigger pointing at risk taking when we're talking about someone with both an eating disorder plus an impulse contro control disorder that often lands us somewhere in the substance use and addiction field. We know a lot of clients have obsessive compulsive disorder and that's because they share an etiological relationship with an eating disorder. Um, we know it's less linked with the actual anxiety, but more towards the um, etiological relationship on, neurotrans on the neurotransmitter, the neurotransmitter level of both of these. And I noted about anxiety, the research on depression is about the same that about 50 to 70 percent predate the depression to the eating disorder. And we have spoken about traumas and the type of traumas, but we have not spoken about what traumas do and the footprint that they leave. So typical uh, or common traumatic events with clients with the eating disorder include illness, medical procedures, 
any type of abuse, including domestic violence, bullying, or neglect, or objectification. And the body is often the canvas that screams the pain. And so when there's excessive trauma, then um, if I couldn't control what happened to me, I can control what happens in me. And oftentimes that comes with some self-harm behaviors. We know that 25% of uh, people with eating disorders do some type of self-harm and the risk of suicide goes up particularly with people with bulimia and a co-occurring alcohol abuse because it just tears us apart. Eating disorders tear people apart from a social, physiological, psychological, and spiritual ways and just in horrific ways. There's a lack of intimacy to a lack of meaning and all the way through that we know people um, have a hard time even being in their bodies when they first come here. So to do the courageous work that it takes in order to heal from an eating disorder is that psychological plus within the body plus my social plus my spiritual and physiological ways of being in the world need to get addressed. And the good news about all this tearing apart is that maybe it's the backwards sort of way to treat. In other words, it's the backwards recipe. If I was to read that statement, was it a cat I saw, and I think that's a has a fancy word like a palindrome, then if I were to read it left to right or right to left, it would read the same. So perhaps in the tearing apart, we have, in fact, our formula or our, our way of being to treatment plan how to put someone back together again. And we know it takes a very collaborative process during family week, someone said something in great tears and said, I, I should have, I could have, I would have seen this, addressed it more. And I thought one of the kindest responses came from our medical director, Dr. Alan Miller, who said, I have never seen a family member be able to heal someone they love from an eating disorder. By the time it comes to the point where it is a diagnosable disease, then it takes so much to help support the person coming back to a place where they aren't torn apart, that it takes an entire team and a collaborative one of that. So we have that team at Monarch Cove, and in fact we have a lot of the evidence-based modalities that are noted in the field to being able to work. And we have a lot of modalities inherent into our system or available within the Monarch Cove system, each designed to unearth the vital information or way to connect with a person that has an eating disorder to increase the recovery itself, which is our ultimate goal. We know things about CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy work, which is a way of thinking about how I'm thinking. And in fact, the field has evolved from a way of connecting both inward and outward using the 12-step models or dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, which is um, to use an overused term, it's like CBT plus a mindfulness component, so not just thinking about how I'm thinking, but rather being conscious and mindful about what that is, what the experience is. And it's particularly effective at reducing self-harm behaviors and other addictive behaviors. And of course, we have exposure therapy, group therapy, and we have neurofeedback, which is a gentle way of approaching the cognitive brain functioning and enhancing it while someone's here in a way that they can see. It's very interesting in its own seminar. So how do we pull all of this together? We pull all of this together with a team that pulls it together, and we create resilience. We do that by the exposures and the challenges and having the person accomplish through the kind of challenges that come to them and with the support and being able to see it through the mirror of the milieu and or the staff that they have accomplished and then being able to take that in, taking that into their experience and they're consciously taking that into their body so that there's a reparative experience in how I have gone all the way through to the point of resiliency. So it's a process of constantly going in and understanding the connections to different things. I had a client say yesterday that she was so happy to be here after a couple of different treatment experiences because she said that it was the first time that a lot of attention was focused on really connecting why. Why does this hurt so much? Why do I need to numb out so much? And, and 
it was both eye-opening and a little intimidating to understand the depth of, of the invitation that we present at Monarch Cove to really understand the functioning of the eating disorder in a very honoring way. Um, there's an old phrase, don't take a crutch away from a one-legged man. We, instead of trying to get an adversarial relationship for you, we say, help us understand. Help us help you understand. And together we will understand the function of the eating disorder. And then perhaps we can find different ways that are not destructive to get those same needs met or to understand why I even have that need that can replace the eating disorder and dislodge it from the um, imminent need that I feel and create energy around. And then there's a connection. There's a connection to other people, to understanding that I'm not the only one, that my thoughts, my feelings, my expression of my eating disorder is um, maybe completely out of control in my own mind and at the same time it's held as not a normative experience but not an unusual one either with other people with eating disorders. And here we have all of the eating disorders represented so that continues a call to the commonality that threads them. And it's a hard and challenging process and for um, myself, it's, it's important I hear from clients all the time right before family week that they want their loved people to understand that they have to go through this journey. And those that wander towards us or through this journey are not lost but in the grand reclaiming of who they are and need to go through this process which is really intense. And a lot of family one, members want to know, is it going to work? Well, based practice that the earlier we know, and if there is some willingness and readiness to change, then our chances of success, including complete of treatment without recidivism, goes up. And that happens a lot with following a treatment team's advice. Um, it, you know, it takes a lot to get here. And so there is a courage and an inherent trust that's asked once you do get here. But it is nice if someone can say, I'm, I'm so tired or I have the gifts gift of desperation, the way I've been doing something hasn't worked, just show me and hold me as I try something different because then there's a, a way that we can show a different way of being. If someone that you love is returning home from a treatment center, then oftentimes that there is a structure which is not the same as designing your home around the eating disorder rituals and rigidity. But it is important to try to set up a team so that you don't have to play a dual role of family member plus therapist or whatever else. And then understand that it's been a journey where of both connection inward and outward. And so easy does it as we go forward in allowing the person to come into a life or return to a life that has been part of, at least in their narrative, their disease. Not that it's blaming, but that it may be triggering. So it's important to go gentle, overprotective, because we do get resiliency through overcoming challenges. And that can come through straight talk and open communication while being a good role model around food, exercise, and then not categorizing things as bad or good, but allowing the person to have the journey and take that investigative stance of, huh, is this how you're defining health? And everybody's been through enough, but as a sign of help and hope, I do like the quote by Hippocrates that says, the natural healing force within each of us is the greatest force in getting well. And so for getting well, to broaden that definition for the family members of, that can mean learning more, developing meaningful communication with your loved one and with others that can support you. Because oftentimes, I don't know about your family, but in my Roman, Irish, Catholic family, we kind of circle the wagons once the disease hit. And we're trying to understand and protect the person we loved. But in doing so, in circling those wagons, in some ways, we enveloped the disease inside the center of our concern and became more isolating around it. But the opposite is probably the way to go, is to talk, to connect, to get support, to not just make it all about the disease and interact in a way that doesn't center specifically on the eating disorder. There's great support networks. Um, 
such as our, through our alumni group, Al-Anon, but it's really important to do something other than blame with the guilt that may or may not be present. And so it's helpful also to have someone for you, um, whether that's professional help and someone who understands or someone who is a friend who can support you through the days that are tough. And all the points that look like ends are truly beginning, particularly if someone you love has made the courageous choice to be willing enough to go through the journey of a treatment center. Uh, I want to pause and make sure that I'm leaving room for questions and or thoughts. Yes, thank you so much, Christine. That was wonderful. Um, I do have a couple of questions here for you, so let me just uh, get those to you. And if you do have questions, just type them on the questions feature of your uh, GoToWebinar screen. Um, so one of the questions is, how does doing self-care for myself impact my loved one's disease, treatment, or recovery? Oh, what a great question. I love even the premise of the question because at least there's someone who's considering self-care. Um, I truly believe that it's not only beneficial but essential. And I'll, I'll say that in a couple of different ways. I think one of the ways that it's essential is because it doesn't help to fall into the same hole. So if I was walking along and I think there's an old parable about a donkey falling into a deep well and the farmer who came alongside jumped into the well hearing the cries of pain, then there was two people in the well. Um, and, and so in that respect, we need to stay healthy enough to be able to support. And we need to be healthy in our own right, not just out of a need or want or desire to be available for support when that is called for, but because I don't want to let the disease take the center stage in my life in my loved person's life so I cannot allow it to, to take its own seat at my dinner table. If it becomes all about the disease, then there's not enough room to be able to understand or even role model what I'm trying to do recovery for. By the time some of our families come to family week, I look around the room and boy, we're all just really tired. <laughs> and if that's the case and if that applies to you, then um, my gentle invitation slash challenge would be to take a look at your own life and say, am I role modeling what is on the other side of healing? I know for me for a long time I was not when I was all about the care and concern and answering the phone call on the first ring every single time because I didn't know what was going to hit me next and I put off hobbies, interest, relationships, because gosh darn it, I had to be available to the person who was struggling. Whether, or whether, whether I was or whether I was not called on, that was my need and anxiety to never miss one of those calls for help because they were sometimes far between, you know, far and few between. But in doing that, I created myself to be such a wreck that I was A, unavailable to help in a really healthy way once I was called on sometimes, but B, I was definitely, if anybody looked across the aisle and said, oh great, so that's what fully living life looks like, then I would not have been a very good reflection to that. So for those two angles generally, plus um, I, I truly believe that you know, we must be the change we want to see in the world, to quote a Gandhi, uh, if we want health. And if that is what we are on the soapbox about, then we better be really living it, feeling it, wearing it ourselves as the definition and the invitation. Wonderful. Thank you. And just one other question. Um, what does it look like in real life to distinguish between my loved one and his or her disease? And does that mean I should respond differently to him or her than I do his or her yes. disease? Oh boy, that's such a great question. In real life, I think it is very challenging to distinguish the eating disorder and the person that you love. Um, and with that complicating factor, I'll just use the pronoun him to, for the sake of ease, but if I am dealing with my loved person and he is creating all of the things that would support an eating disorder, then it's probably the eating disorder talking. 
for instance, if I am hearing him say excuses about why he can't eat with me or um, he is cheating, lying, stealing to be able to isolate with the eating disorder rather than come into connection with me, then I'm probably talking to the eating disorder. It's follow the trail to see what it's supporting. If it's supporting health, then I would hope that I'm talking to my authentic relationship with that person. If it is going towards the eating disorder or is serving it, then I'm probably talking to someone that's, that's the eating disorder. And it can be tricky, there's no doubt. I have um, someone in my life who what I've eaten. Okay, because um, that's a tricky one. Are you downloading that to me because we're still food focused? Or are you downloading that to be I'm your priest and you're going to confession? So it gets really confusing and, and my answer is that you don't have to know and I think there's a healthy relationship that can hear the question right back to the person. If it's that case of the person calling me with I've got to tell you everything that I ate today. My answer would not be about judgment about the food or whatever was about to come out of the person's mouth next. Oh, that wasn't enough. That was enough. Blah, blah, blah. My answer back would be a question. Is this healthy for you? Are you going towards health? And if someone is you know, showing their fangs of the eating disorder and wanting me to fall in line with the eating disorder, I, I, I can give myself permission to say, you know, I hear you and I hear you're in pain and I feel like I'm talking to something that would be in support of an eating disorder and I'm on your side. I want to get back to the point where we wear the same team colors and we are in support of your ultimate health. So I want to be placed in that position of support and I want to be there for you in that way. And I'm sorry, I can't put on the team colors of eating disorder. I love you too much. I hope that clarifies it in a way that asks the person to take ownership in the program. Um, in 12-step programs, we have a phrase about giving the person the dignity to succeed or fail. And so ideally, it's you know their journey, and so you can feed that question back. And it can be really helpful to just create the pause to see if that person is in the grip of their eating disorder and operating from that place. Sometimes it's just the suggestion it takes that allows them to take a step back and say, wait a minute. And anytime you can put a pause in the process, you're creating the what fires together, wires together, neuroscience that would support doing something different than an addictive process. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Christine. And um, that's all the time that we have today for questions. And But thank you so much for joining us and for listening and, for, and to Christine for her wonderfully insightful presentation on families and recovery. And, um, and if you want to share this with anyone, this is going to be recorded and it will be up on um, Monarch Cove's YouTube channel um, probably tomorrow. And so uh, we will um, be, you know, posting out the link on our social media and stuff. Feel free to share with, with anyone. Anyone. So thank you so much, Christine, for taking the time to do this. Thank you. My honor and my pleasure. Everybody have a great night. Bye-bye.